so um, I'm, I'm supposed to give a European pr perspective on recognizing qualifications and measuring competence, which is quite a difficult task in some regards and quite simple in others. Um, re regarding, um, and I'm of course massively simplifying here, but regarding qualifications that are required to practice archaeology in most of Europe, um, depend of course on the role you do. If you're working um, in the commercial sector or in, in field archaeology, as a site assistant working under supervision, there's normally no qualifications required whatsoever. Um, site workers can be from any runs of life, and um, I come originally from Austria. I've, I've worked with um, people who are prisoners, I've worked with the long-term unemployed, I've worked with anything you can imagine as workers on the site. So qualifications don't matter there. As a site supervisor, technician, officer, however you want to call, a role that is providing some degree of supervision to others or taking on responsibilities of some kind in the process other than doing the actual digging, um, which of course in itself is already quite a responsibility in my opinion, but um, that, that doesn't matter apparently. Um, again, there's normally no requirement for any formal qualifications even though there are some exceptions to this rule in some European countries. In Germany, for instance, the role of site technician or excavation technician, Grabungstechniker in, in German, is a special role on sites. And uh, there is formal training available for that, either through a degree at the Hochschule für Technik und Wirtschaft Berlin or via an apprenticeship model that, however, is being phased out at the moment, and there's ever fewer um, of such apprentices that go through that apprenticeship route. Mostly to do that, this is mostly run by the uh, German state heritage offices, who, are, as all state heritage offices or national heritage offices, are facing constant cuts and therefore have ever fewer places for anything. Competence at those levels is normally assessed not very much, but mostly either by personal knowledge of the prospective employee. So, I mean, you can get started as someone with no qualifications whatsoever, acquire that, and as you acquire the competences, um, your boss will know that, hopefully, and therefore um, then either uh, promote you in their organizations or if you move on to another organization, pass on a reference by word of mouth or something, um, frequently over a beer or something like that with a prospective future em employer. Very rarely there are things like reference letters that are being provided, but in, in my career in European archaeology, I have not yet seen a formal reference letter being included in any application that I've ever seen, and they are not normally requested. Um, well, very rarely there can be other written forms of proof of competence, for instance, for the Grabungstechniker in Germany, but that happens only very rarely. In much of Europe, on the other hand, if you want to be a site director or project officer or project leader, someone who is holding chief responsibility for some excavation or archaeological field work, normally you will need an excavation or field work permit, which is normally issued by a national or state heritage agency to that specific person who's in charge of the excavation. And that, across much of Europe, is normally issued only to archaeology graduates. That may indeed in some countries be a legal requirement. In Austria, for instance, it is, and I'll come back to that point. In other countries, it may just be customary, but still be effectively uh, a firm rule. Often, that requirement to hold a degree is also connected with the requirement of having considerable practical field experience to be able to progress on to that role. Um, sometimes, the authorities issuing these permits also insist 
on whoever wants to take on such a, a, a duty um, will need to have some leadership experience, um, which in some cases leads to a very interesting inherent conflict. How do you get leadership experience if you need leadership experience to actually lead an excavation? Even though normally that can be acquired by deputizing uh, on projects led by others, and then that deputy role is again confirmed in many cases by word of mouth, um, or, or similar forms of a national uh, heritage agency ringing up a former employer and saying, did that person actually deputize for you? And then accepting that word of mouth by telephone. Frequently, it's also not just an academic degree that is required, but it frequently is at least a master's degree in archaeology. So, for instance, in Austria, Belgium, Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, Ireland, Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania, and so on, um, that is the normal expectation. So, if you just got to BA, you're stuffed effectively. It's worth nothing. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes it is possible for heritage agencies to issue such permits to graduates from related subjects, but sometimes it can refuse to issue or even be prohibited by law to issue permits to, sub uh, to, to graduates of different subjects. So for instance, the Austrian National Heritage Agency strictly refuses uh, to issue permits for magnetometry or GPR surveys even to people who hold a PhD in archaeological geophysics. But that is not an archaeology degree, but a geophysics degree in their opinion. And Austrian law says it can only be issued to archaeology graduates. So they strictly refuse that. So you get people who are specialists for that field, who are much better than the ordinary archaeology graduate in doing it, and they can't get a permit for doing this. In other fields, in heritage agencies, museums, and universities, now it's normally also at least an MA, in some, some countries even increasingly a PhD, that is effectively the qualification to be hired at least for a permanent position. Um, of course, that's especially the case in universities. In universities now, pretty much universally, the PhD is uh, a required minimum qualification for getting a job. It gets even worse if you have to progress to higher levels or want to progress to higher levels. So for progression to a professorship or other comparable higher positions, in some countries now a habilitation or an equivalent qualification may be required. For those who don't know what a habilitation is, you may know of the higher or second doctorate that still some British universities offer where you get the DLIT or uh, BPhil or other not PhD degree. Um, <coughs> That is roughly the equivalent, um, and it usually requires the submission of some postdoctoral thesis, which is usually significantly more substantial than a normal PhD thesis. So I hold one of those habilitations, um, and my habilitation thesis was 300,000 words approximately, and that was yeah, acceptable. So that's roughly three to four times, possibly even five times, the length of a, a UK PhD these days. And if it had been considerably less, it simply wouldn't have been accepted because it wasn't enough work. OK. Um, <clears throat> if you're coming from a country um, where there is no habilitation system, postdoctoral publications by scholars without a habilitation can be accepted by appointment panels as an equivalent contribution to scholarship, but there's no guarantee for that. If you're coming from a country that has a habilitation system these days, chances of getting a progression to a professorship without one is virtually nil. Now, how are that qualifications, which are effectively academic qualifications because nothing else really counts for much, how are they recognized in Europe? Now, academic qualifications, we, we all know there's the Bologna system where everything is transferable across Europe, still doesn't guarantee that your academic qualification is automatically recognized in a different European country. Rather, validation of degrees is a national matter. 
there's a European Union-wide system via the so-called ENIC or NARIC national centers, according to the European Union directive that I've put up there, um, that needs to be gone through to actually have your, formally, your, your degree formally recognized. And that is frequently just a formality and not necessary for actually getting employment. I've never had my Austrian degrees recognized or validated in this country. They just accept that I hold a, a master's, a PhD, and a habilitation from the University of Vienna. And I'm grateful for that because I didn't have to bother going through a validation process, but the university that employs me here could well have insisted on me going through that validation process and having my degrees recognized as actual archaeology degrees um, rather than um, just accepting them as they are. Where regulated professions are concerned, um, the same applies in principle. It's normally a, a national matter unless it's a, a number of very specific recognized professions like architecture or medicine um, or similar things. Um, archaeology on top of this normally isn't a, a, a regulated profession, but maybe partially be regulated through heritage law. So the archaeology degree requirement for excavation or fieldwork permits, if that is part of the heritage law of a particular country, is in effect state regulation of archaeology. So that may then be linked with the recognition of academic qualifications. So I've already mentioned the Austrian uh, National Heritage Agency several times. Under Austrian heritage law, they do not need to accept any but some Austrian degrees. They don't even need to accept all Austrian archaeology degrees. Only some are automatically acceptable under the law. And many others are not necessarily accepted by the Heritage Agency. And they may refuse to recognize a British or German or whatever other degree unless it is formally validated through the national validation system. So, if my friend Kenny Aitchison here, um, who holds a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, unless I'm mistaken, wants to go to Austria and uh, dig a hole um, and asks for a permit, they, the, the Austrian National Heritage Agency can say, what? You've got a degree from the University of Edinburgh, never heard of them. We don't care. Thank you. Goodbye. Um, and, and, and incidentally, your, your PhD was on something very weird, like archaeology labor market analysis, as if anybody needs that. Um, so really, you have no idea about archaeology. You only have ideas about archaeologists, and they may be very weird. Um, therefore, we simply don't accept that. Unregulated professions, again, validation of qualifications is an entirely national matter. And most of archaeological practice is unregulated. So if I, with my MCIFA, went to Germany and said, oh, I'm a member of the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, I've proven my competence um, in a system that you Germans don't even know, don't even have and wouldn't have a clue how to run, um, at least at the moment. Um, but they can say, oh, pfft, that means you're competent. We don't care. Go on, bye-bye. Um, whatever your home is, Britain, Austria, we don't care. Anyway, not in Germany. <clears throat> so things like the, the competence matrix that CIFA has, which incidentally is a very interesting system of assessing competence, is nice, but in a European context, except with perhaps a very few individuals like Mark Spanier there, who knows what that means, um, isn't worth much, if anything. And indeed, most of our European colleagues don't even know that. Actually, the Germans, since I mentioned them, are currently just having an ongoing debate about whether it's a good idea to found a German professional association of archaeologists. Um, and I'm, I'm participating in that debate and have, have had to explain the CIFA competence matrix at least thrice in different threads, because people, of course, can't read different threads in the ongoing online debate. So I had to explain that at least thrice, because hardly anyone there had the foggiest what that actually means and how it actually can work. So that, that is a problem. 
assessment of competence generally is a problem in much of, of that European archaeology. Because apart from assessment of competence during the degree, there is virtually no assessment of competence other than based on personal knowledge. So by and large, there's no formal systems of recording and tracking competence, and there's no independent assessment of competence either. There's not even systems of regulating levels of competence. During the degrees, indeed, assessment also varies. I mean, I've recently looked into the issue of archaeological field school training as part of my, my role of chairing the A Committee on Teaching and Training of Archaeologists. And to put it politely, the quality is highly variable. In some cases, actually in a shocking large number of cases, field schools use trainees as cheap labor effectively without any systematic training program, without any real means of ensuring that competences are embedded through the process, people just work on a dig and hopefully will pick up the skills they need. Um, and the assessment of competence also ranges widely. Um, there are cases where everyone gets a first for the field school module simply for participation, regardless of competence. Actually, my first field school when I was a student, which of course is some 30 years ago and may not be entirely representative of current practice anymore, but according to reports of some students I've talked to may still be reasonably um, accurate as a reflection of modern standards in some field schools too, was I was going on a dig, I was put to various tasks which nobody explained to me how to do, I didn't learn drawing, I didn't learn taking site photographs, I learned digging. And that I basically learned from looking at my colleagues sitting next to me, most of which had as little experience as I had, and picking up whatever we thought was right. And things like that are still going on, and still we all got first. And I don't get why. I mean, either we were all immensely talented young geniuses who just picked up archaeology by sniffing at the soil, um, or it was simply not assessed. And, I mean, you can gather what is the more likely um, possibility. There can be some forms of assessment, unstructured assessment, for instance, by visual inspection of the trainee's work. Um, so somebody, the site director, the field school leader, um, is just looking at what people do and based on, based on his gut feeling, decides that one gets a first because I like him, um, that one gets a third because he's got an ugly nose, um, whatever. Um, or, I mean, that person is actually working very hard, that person is rather lazy, and that's what I'll reflect with my, my grades. There are, of course, also good practice examples where there is a, a structured assessment of both practice and theoretical knowledge where either things like the archaeology skills passport, of which you may have heard already, or similar and comparable systems are in place, but that is restricted to the individual field school who does it, and not everyone does it systematically. <coughs> and the same goes depending on the university or academic system in general in a country, that only knowledge may be formally assessed, um, so that you effectively are only tested on whether you have learned something by heart that is considered firm knowledge, um, and not whether you can apply it competently. Assessment of competence may be by thesis only, so all your formal assessment in the degree other than the thesis itself is assessed based on whether you've learned what you've been taught in terms of formal knowledge. And then the application of the knowledge that you've acquired is tested on whether you can write a competent, whether you can competently write a thesis. And that effectively is assessing academic writing competence and not practical competence. Um, but there are also examples where assessment of competence may be fully integrated into a degree. So again, there is a wide range 
of options, but ultimately it's all, all you get out of that normally is a degree that says either you've got that overall result or itemized by individual modules, you did those modules with that um, uh, grade and it doesn't tell you whether competence was actually um, tested at all or assessed at all. In fact, there's uh, partially a shocking lack of common standards, particularly in archaeological training. In the UK, there are things like the National Vocational Qualifications and the national uh, standards that go with that, um, or the, the QAA archaeology subject benchmarks that at least try to establish a core standard for what the degree needs to contain or what skills you need to acquire. In many European countries, you don't have anything like that. Um, what archaeology is and how archaeology taught in many cases is a matter of academic freedom or university autonomy and there's not even communication necessarily between different universities as to what an archaeology degree should actually train people in or what it should not. So that, that is almost completely lacking. There are also hardly any commonly recognized qualifications so the British NBQs in archaeological practice might be recognized in Germany as equivalent to that apprenticeship model, the Grabungstechniker nach Frankfurter Modell. Um, so you might get into an excavation technician position in German excavations with that, but elsewhere it's unlikely to get you any brownie points in anything. On the other hand, the German Grabungstechniker may be recognized and lead to a good career in UK archaeology, but even in Germany, Grabungstechniker aren't even properly recognized as archaeologists because they only do the digging and the organizing of the dig and actually the strategy of what gets recorded and what not and um, how things are dug and uh, all that other stuff, that isn't really archaeology. Well, in some, some people's opinion, apparently. Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't even get you very far in Germany, necessarily. Everywhere else in Europe, pretty much, it won't get you anywhere because that's not an archaeology degree. So that is also a problem. And especially where levels are, of competence are concerned, there are no standards that I've come across, apart from the, the CIFA standards I showed before, that, that seem to exist. So there is no means of transnationally comparing is a person a competent archaeologist competent for that particular kind or level of job um, other than looking at their degree certificate and personal knowledge. So with that I'm finished. In simple terms, Europe doesn't recognize your qualifications unless it is a validated MA or PhD. Other than that, there's really not much in terms of accepted common standards or anything. Thank you very much.